what an amazing time we have had at the Beloved Community Global Summit. Uh, my name is Cameron Friend, and I am the social media and content manager for the King Center, and I will be serving as your moderator for our next great session. And I want to go ahead and I want to invite um, our panelists to come up. This is going to be a tremendous discussion. And with us for this conversation is going to be Dr. Lily Baxter. We're going to have an opportunity to hear from Sierra Fly Bobo and an opportunity to hear from Pastor Curtis Johnson as well. This is going to be a powerful discussion where we're going to be able to talk about how do we understand nonviolence as the pathway to a beloved community mindset? What does that look like for us as we're having this conversation, as we are wanting to go forward and understanding how nonviolence helps to change us internally, uh, but also how nonviolence helps us to be who we can be for this world. Each and every one of us has a responsibility here. We have a responsibility to each other. We have a responsibility to do good to our neighbors. So what does that look like? And the process of nonviolence is one that is a journey. It takes time. It is a path. But along the way, we meet people. We encounter scenarios, we encounter circumstances that help us to go from where we are right now to where we will be. So this is going to be a great discussion. Uh, we're going to have an amazing time talking to our amazing, amazing team. And this is going to be a wonderful panel. Everybody, Dr. Baxter, Pastor Curtis Johnson, Fly, how's everything going today? Very Fantastic. good. Great day. Uh, going great. Well, again, I would love for people just to get a little uh, familiar with you all. Um, Dr. Lily Baxter, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your affiliation with the King Center? Sure. Thank you. Happy to be here. Um, well, if I were to describe myself, I'm a teacher. I'm an idealist, but also a realist. I'm an activist and a writer. And I was very fortunate to have Mrs. King as my mentor during the years that she was developing the King Center. And I remember uh, sitting in Mrs. King's kitchen, uh, being interviewed for the position of uh, Director of Nonviolence uh, Education and Trainings. And it's been uh, a remarkable journey. This was in the late 70s uh, to watch the King Center grow. Um, to develop materials with Mrs. King to try to figure out how to teach Kingian nonviolence, how to reach uh, not only the Black community that Dr. King was so beholden to and grown from, but also the wider world. The vision was so expansive. Um, and I did, I worked uh, on various programs and learned so much about uh, never giving up. As you say, Cameron, hope, um, having an indomitable faith, all those things were part of Mrs. King's very makeup. And then um, at a certain point in my life, I really felt I needed to give back to my people. I felt a great gratitude for how I was raised in an activist home of Holocaust survivors within a community of activist survivors. Um, and despite the Holocaust, they never gave up on the human potential for creating a better world. And I, I was raised in that kind of environment. Um, and for um, over a decade directed the Holocaust Center here in Atlanta, the Holocaust Education Center. And what can I say? Um, I am joyfully devoted to uh, nonviolence and human rights. And teaching what I believe is a philosophy of life and a methodology for social change that can really change the world. So um, <laughs> that's uh, a little about who I am. Well, we thank you so much for that, Dr. Lily Baxter. Pastor Curtis Johnson, please tell the world about who you are, please, sir. Well, thank you so much. I, uh, my name is, uh, again, I am a pastor of a church that my grandparents founded back in 1987. I took over in 1993. 
So for the past 30 years, Mr. Bowne, I've been uh, the pastor of the Valley Brook Outreach Baptist Church in Pelzer. I'm also a community activist and uh, I just kind of do a lot of things as it relates to finding ways to um, build up our community and help people. Uh, really, I've had a heart for the human condition for many, many years. Um, got connected with Dr. Bernice King and Miss Mother Coretta King uh, back in early 2000, 2002, 2003. So for about 20 years now, we've had a relationship. And over those years, myself and Dr. Bernice King have engaged in several projects that we've launched here in the, in the, in the upstate South Carolina area. Uh, MLK Dream Weekend became uh, our community way, a community-wide celebration for the King holiday. And then we've done 100 Days of Nonviolence and uh, several things that we've kind of collaborated with uh, or worked in, co in, in connection with the King Center upon. Um, and <clears throat> more recently, we helped to facilitate a relationship between the King Center and the NFL and uh, working on some new things that we're doing hopefully with uh, another organization, another international organization as well, connecting with the King Center. Uh, I, I sincerely believe uh, that the teachings, the principles and the strategies of the beloved community of Nonviolence 365 is life-changing, it's world-changing. It, it impacts the heart, the mind, the soul, the culture. And uh, I believe it is, a, it is a huge answer to a lot of what we see in our world today. And so I'm glad to have, and honored to be a part uh, of the King Center, as well as the family within the King Center. And I'm glad to be here with you today. Yeah, thank you so much, Pastor Curtis. Fly, can you please tell us about yourself? Yes, yes. Um, greetings, everyone. I'm so excited. Uh, my name is Sierra Fly Bobo. And I got introduced uh, to the King Center in 2011 from the perspective of just learning about Dr. King's philosophy and methodology. And that, um, that pre next year, um, our current CEO, Dr. Bernice A. King, um, she started an initiative which was called uh, Camp Now. It used to be called Camp Now, and um, it was a summer camp for youth. And I was able to become a part of the uh, facilitator team and, um, and eventually became a Nonviolence 365 trainer. And I've been working with the King Center ever since. So that's um, almost 12 years now. And mm -hmm. so it's really an honor um, to work with the young people and just a little bit about my background. I am a founder of a nonprofit here in the metro Atlanta area um, called Fly Life, where we empower girls ages 10 to 20 to be fly inside out. And we partner with the school systems and we go in with our curriculum and uh, we have, you know, an app and uh, we do conferences for teen girls. Um, and so it's just been really a privilege um, and a passion of mine to serve young people and to empower them. And um, now with the King Center, I'm working with the beloved Community Leadership Academy um, as one of the trainers. And it's, it's truly an honor um, to take Dr. King's philosophy and to break it down on a level that young people can not only understand it, but begin to apply it. Mm. Well, uh, by the way, everyone that you're, you're having an opportunity to listen to three people that are deeply uh, integrated in what the King Center is doing, all um, three of uh, Dr. Baxter, uh, Pastor Curtis Johnson, and Fly, they're all trainers here at the King Center. Um, Dr. Lily Baxter is a senior instructor uh, in MB365 here at the King Center as well. So this is going to be an incredible conversation. And y'all, before we get started with the questions, I want to I want to set the framework for the conversation a little bit by reading a quote directly from Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Dr. King says that, therefore, I venture to suggest to all of you and all who hear and may eventually read these words, that the philosophy and strategy of nonviolence becomes immediately a subject for study and for serious experimentation in every field of human conflict, by no means excluding the relations between nations. It is, after all, nation states which make war, which have produced the weapons which threaten the survival of mankind, and which are both genocidal and suicidal in character. And again, the name of this panel is Nonviolence at the Pathway to a Beloved Community Mindset. So y'all, I am so ready to get started. Uh, the first question um, that I have for each of you is as we near the end of day two, um, we're revisiting what the beloved community is and what a beloved community mindset entails. So in your study of Dr. King's philosophy, the beloved community and nonviolence. What have you come to understand 
the beloved community and the corresponding mindset to be? What does that look like for each of you? We can go ahead, uh, Dr. Baxter, we'd love to maybe hear from you first here. Okay, thank you. Um, a beloved community mindset. Um, it, it, it's um, all of your capacities. Um, uh, the way you think, the way you feel, the way you um, frame and understand what life is about and our interconnectedness to all living things. Um, it, is a, it, it is captured in some ways um, in the six principles and six steps that Dr. King um, uh, presented in, in his writings and teachings. Uh, in particular, the six principles, uh, because they are the philosophical basis. And the mindset is how you get up in the morning, how you interface with the people who you live with, the people who you work with, how you um, put what you do within the perspective of a larger community. And I think it includes an, a, an anchoring in uh, an ethical life, a moral life. You know, when Dr. King was introduced at the March on Washington in 1963, he was described as the moral leader of our nation. And he's been perceived that way. We don't do enough with understanding how important a life that is connected to love and compassion and justice and truth um, is. And ultimately, this beloved community mindset includes love, being love. And community is the sense that you are one in many. So um, that is my crack at what is a beloved community mindset. Wow. I appreciate that, Dr. Baxter. Uh, Pastor Curtis, uh, what are your thoughts here on this question? Um, <clears throat> learning and understanding the beloved community the way that I have has restructured, if you, way, if you will, the way that I perceive persons, the way that I perceive challenges, uh, the way that I perceive community issues, et cetera. Um, when I look at people differently, um, I look at even the people who may oppose me or who may create a conflictual environment, I can see potential in that person. I can see that regardless of who they are, um, there is an element of God in them. Uh, somebody said there's, there's good and the worst of us, you know. Um, there's something inside of everybody that if we can focus on that image of God that Dr. King talked about that's inside of them uh, with the right circumstances and right motivations, perhaps we can find a way to not only coexist, but to really appreciate one another and to really integrate in terms of heart, mind, and soul into this brotherhood, this beloved community. And so if I deal with that, um, you know, it's, it's like Stephen Covey said, begin with the end in mind. If that, if we have that end in mind of the beloved community, then the approach that I'll take, regardless of the situation, regardless of the conflict, um, I'm careful on how I'll deal with each individual. I don't want to tear each person down. I don't want to find reasons for us to, to divide and separate, but I want to find ways to cause us to find common ground and come together and, and create. So it, it, it affects the way I approach any situation and it affects the way I perceive every person. So the Bluff community mindset uh, changes my approach to anything that I'm in. Wow. Wow, that was great. Thank you so much, Pastor. That was amazing. Bly, what are your yeah. thoughts on this? Man, I'm when I think about it, just studying Dr. King, we also heard Dr. King speak of the fact that we inherited a world house, that we inherited a home, right? And we inherited this house. And um, basically that we all live on earth and that we all are, you know, you know, forced to live together, right? And this is old song that came out, I believe in the 1980s uh, by Luther Vandross that said, the house is not a home. And so when I think about it, even though we inherited this world house, 
the goal is to turn the house, the place in which we all dwell as in humanity, into a home. And the beloved community to me represents that home. And everything about a home feels great, right? Everything about a home makes you feel love. And I think that's the key that you even see the word love in the in the word beloved, right? So you use love and as we learned here at the King Center, nonviolence to turn that house into a home. And so when you begin to use nonviolence as that vehicle, you are get will get to what we believe is an achievable society, which is a beloved community where we can all exist, coexist together. Um, I think someone, I think uh, my senior trainer um, spoke about how conflict is going to be present, um, you know, and so it may be present, but we utilize love and nonviolence um, to make sure that despite the conflict that we're going to have as flawed human beings, that we reconcile situations in a loving way, which continues to build and fuel our community. And so that's just how I, I interpret it. You know, I, I believe that it's possible. I believe that it's going to require love, um, agape love as, to be exact, as well as I believe is we're going to have to utilize nonviolent, uh, the nonviolent philosophy and methodology um, to really get us to live in that achievable society of the beloved community. And that's the mindset you have to have. So when you're in everyday conflict, you understand that I have to employ love in this moment in order to make sure that even in the midst of this conflict, I'm not harming another person that's a part of my, of my home, of my beloved community. Wow. So, team, I'm, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna lie. When I heard that Luther Vandross bar, I'm gonna start singing. But I appreciate that, Fly. That was amazing. And I'm actually gonna come right back to you, Fly, because I think there's a little bit of connectivity with what you said. So, my next question is, what is Kingian nonviolence? Which the King Center we rebranded that to Nonviolence Three Six Five. Can you give us a little bit of breakdown of what Kingian nonviolence is and how does that influence? our thinking and then for you personally how has that influenced your individual thinking man it changed my life as, as i said in my intro um when i first came to king center i was i was pretty young um early in my young adult years and um i was i was radical i was on fire i was mad about a lot of the injustices that was happening in the world um, shout out to our ceo dr bernice king who was very patient with me and my radical rawness um, and she didn't give up on my my transformation as it is continuing and it will continue to evolve. However, you know, for me, Nonviolence 365 is a mindset. Um, it's something that, you know, when you begin to study Dr. King, um, you will see that it's a way of thinking, um, especially the, the principles and, and really talking about the principles is a way of thinking. It's a way of engaging. It's a way of speaking. It's a way, um, uh, you know, of how we act. And so, but first it has to penetrate your mind in order for you to have, um, you know, sustainable change in anything in life. You have to think about, you know, just how first, you know, I, I, whatever you are receiving as an input that you're exposed to, it impacts your thinking and your thinking impacts your emotions and your emotions are going to impact your decisions and your decisions are going to eventually turn into your actions. And so that's why it's so powerful because all of us are set up in that and, and with those dynamics. And so with nonviolence, it's almost like you have to feed your soul love and feed your soul and strengthen your soul. It's almost like taking your, your spirit to the gym as one of my senior trainers, Mr. Charles often says all the time, take your taking your spirit and your soul to the gym and building up that strength and, and really, really soaking in the importance of responding nonviolently so that we're not harming one another in our everyday conflicts. And so Nonviolence 365 really has come in and changed my life. And I'll even be transparent in this moment. I recently went through a divorce and I was able to employ some of the things I learned here in the King Center in nonviolence on how to still understand that my ex-husband is still a brother for me in the beloved community and he still deserves love, agape love. And we were able to 
um, navigate through the divorce without harming one another. And we're still friends and we, we co-parent very well. But if I wasn't exposed to something as powerful as Dr. Gaines teaching and the Nonviolence 365 philosophy, I don't know if I would have been equipped to suppress my emotions at times and say, you know what, even though I may feel a certain way, let me choose love because it's a choice. And so Nonviolence 365 to me is powerful and it has really been transformational in my own personal life. Wow. Well, Fly, we thank you for just the transparency in that and the honesty and um, how transformative nonviolence has been for you. That's huge. Uh, Pastor Curtis Johnson, I, I would like to come to you next with this. How, what do you understand Kingy nonviolence to be and how has that, how does it influence our thinking and then what has it done for you as well? One of the things that being exposed to this teaching has done for me is, is helped me to understand the difference between non-hyphen violence and the term non-violence the way we use it at the King Center. Non-hyphen violence just basically means the absence of weapons, the absence of physical weapons. But when we consider that violence is more than the presence of weapons, uh, Coretta King and Dr. King, they, they helped us to understand that poverty is violence. It's the injury of the soul. It's the injury of the mind. It's, it's more than just physical injury. It's, it's, a, it's a degrading, if you will, of humanity. It's, it's the, it's the um, undervaluing of another person's humanity. Um, when I consider that poverty is violence, uh, even if in a marriage or home situation where there's uh, emotional violence or verbal abuse, if you will, all of that is violence. Even if there's no physical uh, violence there, all of that because of, of its way of degrading the human, the human condition or the human heart, et cetera. When I understand Kingian nonviolence and understand it as nonviolence 365, what we call it now, this is an everyday, all day mindset that we're after. It's, it's, it's about lifting the human soul. It's about bless. I'm gonna give you another example of what we do here. As I shared, I'm an, I'm, I'm an activist. I'm a pastor, but I'm an act, activist. Uh, I am the president of our local group called Pastors United for Action. And what we do with Pastors United for Action, uh, I'll just give an example of something that we came up with a few weeks ago. On Christmas weekend, it was extremely cold, um, single digits. Um, I've always had a heart for the homeless, especially in the times of freezing cold. And so I'm very concerned about families when their mothers and, and children, et cetera, they don't have a place to stay. So I share it with our PUA, I'm really concerned about this and I feel like that's something we can do. So of course we have different resources and whatnot in the community, but what I felt that I needed to do in that situation was create something that we have not seen exist in our community. And I stepped up in, in a way to uh, create a situation where we form, we're forming an infrastructure that enables families to um, get help and to find ways. What we've done is, is we, we identified on that weekend about four families that we put up in a hotel for a week, but I realized that just putting them in a week is not going to change the situation. So long story short, we've developed an infrastructure that has a, a mass of different resources, a mass of different people and different, di different things. I realized how important transportation was to the effort of getting people to jobs, et cetera. They couldn't work, et cetera. So um, we, we identified some transportation partners in our community. And then we put out on a post and just said, if anybody has a car that you would like to donate to a homeless family for a thousand dollars or less, if it's in good shape, uh, let me know. I started getting responses of people who would like to donate their cars to these families, have a home mechanic to go down, check it out, make sure it's good. So this past Sunday, I was able to get our one of our fam first families a car for five hundred dollars that's in good shape. The guy just wanted to get rid of it out of his yard. And with that car, she was able to get a job. She started today on a great, on a, on a well-paying job that's going to help to get her family out of the hotel she's been staying in, having to pay $400 every week. 
If you're homeless and don't have a job and don't have a car, how can you afford a $1,600 a week stay in a hotel? So we're putting an infrastructure in place that's helping to change people's situation and lift them out of that. As of this date, we have placed three families into new housing opportunities, uh, getting them transportation to jobs and getting them new jobs. And this is a matter of three weeks that we started this on December 25th, a weekend. So this is what I consider Nonviolence 365. Uh, this is every day, any opportunity to help lift the human condition, break the chains of poverty, and enable persons to live out the, the quality of life that they would desire. Wow. Uh, Pastor Curtis, you said that violence is more than the presence of weapons. Poverty is violence. It is the injury of the soul. It is the injury of the mind. And that is such a great way to help us to encapsulate what NB365 is and at the heart of why you and so many others are doing such great work. So truly appreciate that. Uh, Dr. Uh, Lily Baxter, can you give us an understanding of what King and nonviolence is for you, how it influences our thinking and how it's done that for you yourself? Well, um, you know, I'd like to reflect on a min minute on the passage that you read to open our discussion, because I see it as a challenge from Dr. King. He says um, that we need that the philosophy and strategy of nonviolence needs to become immediately a subject for study and for serious experience experimentation in every field of human contact, conflict. And that is exactly what Fly and Pastor Curtis are doing. They are experimenting with nonviolence. They are applying it and learning from it and bringing the world forward. Um, this is Dr. King's challenge to us, and it includes being social activists from a particular philosophical framework. But Kingian nonviolence is one of a number of schools of nonviolence. Of course, we all know about Gandhi because Dr. King himself, you know, attributed some of his learning from Gandhi. And we have the Dalai Lama, and we have. Um, uh, Mother Teresa, and we have um, many practitioners, uh, Thich Nhat Hanh, uh, uh, practitioners and teachers of nonviolence. Um, we even have schools of nonviolence that are entirely just strategic, learning how to do direct action without violence. I mean, working on um, how to do, how to mobilize, how to, what kind of um, uh, uh, tactics to use, what kind of uh, protest, how to do protest without any basic philosophical belief in the philosophy of nonviolence as a way of life. Now, Dr. King brings those together, ask, is, is aware this passage that you read, uh, uh, Cameron, came very late in Dr. King's life, in his short life, in his 39 years, but it was in his very last book. And he had learned a great deal by then about the application of nonviolence and had actually moved to, as Fly points out, the world house, a global vision. And he is so aware, and we haven't talked enough about it, there's so much to talk about, that he, um, focused on war and the weapons of war and our potential for annihilation as also um, uh, uh, something that the nonviolent practitioner needs to talk uh, needs to uh, work against. So, you know, he had the uh, triple evils. It, it was during that period later in his life uh, that he pulled together and understood the interconnectedness of poverty, racism, and militarism to bring our world and culture and um, uh, to this point that we might even destroy ourselves. So um, I really appreciate what, what you read, Cameron, because I think it, it, it's a challenge to all of us. Um, what Fly and, and Pastor Curtis are doing in their uh, professional and personal lives 
and and um, so to me, Kingian nonviolence is a very rich and full um, philosophy of the personal, mm. the community, the the global. Wow. Dr. Baxter, thank you for that. Um, that's excellent. And even just a way to think more deeply uh, and more critically about the quote as a challenge. And I highly suggest um, anyone that you hear this quote, please go read as much of King as you can to get everything in the full context of who he was and, and what he believed. Um, and, and Patrick Curtis, I want to come back with this question to you first. Um, you know, let's talk about the six principles of nonviolence. So can each of you share two principles and how those two principles help get us to a beloved community mindset. And, and Pastor Curtis, I would like you to start off with principles one and two. Uh, Dr. Baxter, I would love for you to take principles three and four. And then Sierra Fly Bobo, will you please take principles five and six? And then whenever you are ready, Pastor Curtis. Sure, thank you. Um, the first principle as written is nonviolence is a way of life for courageous people. And I wanna take a moment and drive that in just for a moment because one of the things that people misunderstand about nonviolence is many of us perceive it as weak and perceive it as passive, but I don't think people realize how courageous you have to be to knowingly go into an environment or into a situation that could bring danger or harm to yourself, but approach it from a nonviolent way um, when you've seen movies and videos of those persons back in the civil rights movement that would go sit in at different places or have to, you know, do a protest or boycott or something in, in such a way that it may solicit harm. But to go in there knowing that it, it can it can bring damage to your life, but do it anyway, that's that's a lot of courage. That's a that's a lot of, I say that because a lot of men, you know, I'm concerned about men seeing uh, nonviolence and misperceiving it as being weak and being passive. But you got to be a man to stand in the midst of situations where your life can be endangered, but you're bold enough because out of out of a conviction and out of a desire uh, for uh, the well-being of others, you're willing to put your own life on the line. Uh, that says something about courage. Uh, Nonviolence is a way of life for courageous people. It is not a method for cowards. It does not resist. It is active, nonviolent resistance to evil, and it is aggressive spiritually, mentally, and emotionally, if not physically. So this is something that we need to see and understand about nonviolence. It is a way of life for courageous people. And secondly, the principle two, nonviolence seeks to win friendship and understanding. That word seeks to win friendship. It goes into a situation believing and having the faith and the confidence that somehow we can emerge from this situation being friendly toward one another and have an understanding toward one another. So if I'm doing this as a nonviolence 365, it's an all day, every day mindset, then I need to look again, as I said earlier, the way I perceive people has to change. I need to see that person that opposes me or that sees things differently from me, not as an enemy, not as somebody that I need to destroy, but somebody that may just need some more understanding. Maybe we need to understand each other better. Maybe we need to hear each other out and understand each other's perspective, because if I can do that, maybe we can find something in there where we can collaborate, we can work together and find a common ground. This principle helps us to understand that the outcome of nonviolence is the creation of the beloved community, meaning violence creates bitterness, violence creates hate, violence perpetuates division and harm and injury toward others. But nonviolence can create brotherhood, nonviolence. And the outcome of, of what we're doing is what, is what we're focused on because the end result of nonviolence is redemption and reconciliation, not bitterness and hate and destruction. So we're, we're seeking, to, we're, we're focusing on what we can build, not on what we can destroy. Thank you. Wow. Wow. That was absolutely excellent. Thank you so much for that breakdown. Um, now I would love to, to turn to you, uh, Dr. Basker. Uh, this is the, the same question that's offered to you, Dr. Baxter. Uh, principle three. Yeah, so, uh, principle so three I'm doing, four. yeah, three and four. 
So uh, principle three um, is nonviolence. Well, I, I need to say before then that it's very interesting that the six principles are, are come from Dr. King's first book. We just talked about Dr. King's last book. But the philosophy is something he articulated um, from before the Montgomery bus boycott. And the book is Stride Toward Freedom and is about um, the uh, Montgomery bus boycott, and, which in chapter six of Stride Toward Freedom is an entire chapter of pilgrimage to nonviolence. And uh, the third principle in that chapter on nonviolence is that nonviolence seeks to defeat injustice, uh, not people, injustice or evil. And it distinguishes between the person and the deed, that we are always more than an action. We are more than one aspect of our identity. We are more than 30 seconds um, of, of, um, uh, of, um, and evil, and you know, we talked a, a few minutes ago about the evils of poverty, racism. Violence. We're more than being racist. We're more than being um, violent uh, people. Because of that, and because we want to see each person with the eyes of love, with the lens of love, then we have to distinguish between the injustice the person has just perpetrated and may continue to perpetrate and the person doing it. The person is redeemable and we can work to change the behavior and we can work to end the evil because nonviolence recognizes that evil doers are themselves also victims. And you know, you've also heard about hurt people, hurt people. And so much of our culture, all of us, we talk about a trauma and, and post-traumatic um, uh, uh, stress that we all live in. This is a very violent and at times very, also very hateful uh, culture. And so we need to be aware of how people are raised and see the systemic evil that they may be swimming in and think it's reality. And it really is only one perception of reality. So in, in uh, Dr. King in the Montgomery campaign, he talked about, we are out to defeat injustice, not white persons who may be unjust. The tension is between justice and injustice. If there is a victory in the struggle, it will be a victory not merely for the 50,000 black people of Montgomery, but a victory for all people. And when you look back on the Montgomery campaign and you see what came of it, not only in the civil rights movement, but in movements around the world, um, that statement is prophetic. So, Unconditional love, agape love, is at the center of nonviolence. And because of that, we need to make this distinction. As for um, principle four, that nonviolent holds that unearned voluntary suffering for a just cause is redemptive. Um, and in again, in, in um, that chapter on, on the pilgrimage to nonviolence, Dr. King talked about uh, practitioners accepting blows without striking back. And he was, a, a, a lot of principle four deals with how to do a nonviolent direction campaign, the strength and fortitude it takes. Think back to Selma. So many people in the last two days have used Selma as an example. The violence that came to the people who were on that bridge, but nobody fought back. And it changed. I mean, and then they had uh, within two weeks, 8,000 people coming to march from Selma to Montgomery. Um, so one is, uh, so um, unearned suffering um, 
for a just cause needs to be accepted. People will be misunderstood. People will um, uh, um, be shunned, be imprisoned. Um, but ultimately, um, the the it will society and 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 uh, the community will um, be transformed. So um, enough. Yeah. No, that was great, Dr. Baxter. Seriously, uh, thank you so much for that. Um, wow, I mean, there's so much to get to with this. Um, and then fly, you know, we I'd have like to a say one more thing, uh, Cameron, just, I'm sorry, but let me just say one more thing. I looked down in my notes and I remembered, it's very important that we take the long view of history. We tend to be very self-centered. We want everything now. We want it in our lifetimes. We want it immediately. This is one of the lessons from Mrs. King. She was able to look at centuries ahead and see how we are connected to our children, our grandchildren, our great ch grandchildren. Um, and it's very important that we see the human, the, our life, see history beyond the human lifespan. And then you have great hope for the future. Because you thank can look you, back you. and also see where we've come from. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Fly, we have about four minutes left. Uh, could you? Give us a little bit of insight in a couple of minutes. Uh, principles five and six, please. Thank you. Sure, sure. So principle five, nonviolence chooses love instead of hate. We've been talking about it all panel so far, um, that agape love, as Dr. Bass just said, is the center of nonviolence. And as I said in my personal example earlier, it's a choice. And every day you have to choose to respond to whatever comes your way with love and understanding that love is a force that is undefeated. And when you respond in love, just like the example that we just gave in Selma, um, you you know, love it, eventually you're going to reap it. And so you just have to know that choosing love instead of hate is not only good for the person that you're choosing to love, but it's also good for you. When you choose hate, not only um, do you feel like you're harming the other person, you're also harming your soul. And so it's just so powerful with Nonviolence 365 that you always choose to extend agape love in all scenarios, especially in conflict, because we believe that love is transformative. Um, and then principle six, uh, my favorite, Nonviolence believes that the universe is on the side of justice. Here's the thing. We're not in this alone. Um, whether you believe in God or the universe or just any kind of cosmic power, we believe that at the end of the day, that right will win and that we have a cosmic companion that's on our side and that you just have to have faith in when practicing the nonviolence 365 principles um, you don't have to follow any particular religious background however you just have faith in the fact that right will eventually win justice will prevail and when you have that kind of faith it gives you the courage like um, pastor curtis said to um, be nonviolent in your lifestyle because you know that at the end of the day i have a cosmic companion that's on my side that's going to help me propel in this moment and whether it happens in my lifetime my children's lifetime or future lifetimes that eventually right will win and whatever is out of balance will eventually turn back to its proper balance and so that's what we believe and that's the faith that holds us strong and allows us to stay committed to applying these six principles in our everyday life to help us create what we believe is that achievable society of the beloved community. Uh, I'll fly for like 30 seconds. Can you give us an example of what it even means to choose love instead of hate? Um, yes. Um, so just like I was using the example earlier, um, you know, I recently went through a divorce. And so really quickly, I, we have a child involved. And so you could try to use a child to harm the other person or show forth hate towards the other person to withdraw their time with the child. Or you could say, no, this person wants to be a father, just like I want to be a mother. Let's come up with a way that gives us equal access to love, to nurture and develop our child. And that's a way of choosing love instead wow. of hate, mad at your own dynamics of conflict that you have within each other. Wow, no, Fly, that's excellent. Uh, Dr. Baxter, Pastor Curtis Johnson, Sierra Fly Bobo, this was incredible. Um, by the way, y'all, it, it doesn't have to just stop here. 
The King Center has online training available right now. All you have to go is to thekingcenter.org with the King Center Institute, and you yourself can begin the journey of understanding nonviolence in a much more deep and critical way for yourself. And even you can be start to position yourself to be able to teach other people about nonviolence, why it matters, why it's important, and how it has transformed you from the inside out. That way you can be a global change agent and begin transforming your own community right where you are. So panel, team, this has been excellent. I'm so excited. I'm so grateful that I have an opportunity to learn from you all. I hope everyone that listened to this had an amazing time. And y'all, the summit will continue. We will see y'all later.